Yeah, guys. So now we're looking at episode three of Southwest Mock 2023. Of course, the physics of it. Let's go. If you haven't checked out the episodes one and two, guys, please do. It's so amazing. So again, this is our workload. So yeah, make sure you check every one of those episodes to grasp and fully understand every concept that was asked in Southwest Mock 2023. All right, guys, so you're just going to pause the video here and then read the question, okay? So, but you notice that the question is dealing with components of motion as vectors. And I always tell my students, whenever you have projectiles as a vector, maybe you are using vector approach to analyzing projectile problem. That's the easiest kind of projectile problem you can ever have. Because for instance, the X displacement now will just be what? This initial velocity in the X direction because I is a unit vector in the X direction and J is a unit vector in the Y direction. So the displacement in the X direction will just be two times T, okay? The displacement in the Y direction would just be three times T. Then you add the gravity component because when you're going in the Y direction, you're moving against gravity. So you have minus half GC squared. So let's do that here. So our X displacement will just be that initial velocity in the X direction to multiply by T. No problem there. Our Y displacement will be this initial velocity in the Y direction multiplied by T. Then you add the gravity component. Since you are moving against gravity, you're going upwards. Then you are going to have negative half GT squared. Now, our y, we're going to, going to ignore this gravity portion and just consider just this initial portion. I'm going to explain why we're ignoring this gravity portion. Now, we can go over here and then look at the second case where the initial velocity is now 2i plus 4j. And our x nu will now be what? 2 times t because you're still getting this initial velocity in the x direction multiplied by t. And then you go over and then you get the y components of its displacement you get this initial velocity in the y direction you multiply by t and then you add the gravity component to it since these gravity components are equal that's why we're ignoring them can you see negative half gt squared negative half gt squared then you notice that our y nu will be 4t our x nu is equal to our old x 2t 2t our y nu is 4t our y old is 3t so y nu is greater so our answer is b okay greater than y equal to x the answer to why planets will be the sun can be explained by who? Okay, so we have um, our solar system right here. So you have these planets describing elliptical parts about the sun as the focus. That's basically Kepler's first law. But then we understand that gravity is what keeps this planet in intact about or in their orbit about the sun. What then is gravity? So let's get over here. Gravity, you notice that is the distortion in the fabric of space and time itself, right? Created by supermassive objects placed within the fabric of space and time. So you notice that, well, if I if I place the sun, which is a supermassive object within the fabric of space and time, it warps the continuum. And so freely moving objects about the sun get trapped in this distortion and they continues they continue in a cyclic motion about the sun uh if you want to see that diagrammatic representation of that this is really what's happening and then you notice here that the earth itself gets a distortion of the space-time continuum such that freely moving objects like space junk basically like what our moon does about the earth gets trapped in this distortion created by our earth okay so that's why the, the moon basically orbits the earth due to this tiny distortion it creates it's basically like a trampoline right you get a trampoline and then you place a supermassive object at the center of the trampoline and then you roll other balls around that supermassive object you notice that they would continue in a cyclic manner thanks to the distortion created by the supermassive object you've placed at the center. So that's really what gravity is. And that's what is happening here. So Newton's law of universal gravitation that seeks to describe how matter interacts with matter in space basically is trying to calculate or tell you how to find the magnitude of this gravitational force. All right. And it states that, well, this the magnitude of this gravitational force will be proportional to the product of their masses all right the masses of the two objects you're considering and inversely proportional to the square of the mean distance between them all right so the closer you get to this distort to the to the object that creates the distortion the stronger the pull on you all right and the faster you move around them okay so yeah that's basically newton's law of universal gravitation and you notice that that is our answer because that's what describes what gravity is an object of mass 100 kilograms moving at 50 kilometers per hour, what force is needed to bring the object to rest over a distance of 15 meters? Well, work done to bring object to rest is of course change in mechanical energy, right? So just get the change in kinetic energy. We have, since it comes to rest, V final is zero. So we basically have negative half mu squared here. That's our equation one. But again, work done is force times distance. Uh, so you notice that because the force 
the particle is retardating okay so the force and the displacement are in opposite direction all right so you have negative work in that particular case because the particle slows down okay so you now have that well our change in kinetic energy which is negative here will be equal to our negative work done and then you can cancel out the negatives and so have mu squared equals fs so you get over here you make f the subject you have half mu squared over s so you substitute you key in the values and our f is 193 newtons our answer is b Ooh, all right so um yeah these are reviews left by some of our students at the center this and therefore and therefore and therefore Louis marie claire such a wonderful girl we've been privileged to work with uh so i just want to leave a review up here in a very emotionally noble and inspiring manner casey has consistently rectified all our doubts and concept blunders to even rectify scientific inconsistencies that are just plain wrong in the cameroon high school gc syllabus like the conceptual meaning of diffraction pattern young's double slit experiment quantum physics and more after a quick revision of northwest mark 2021 paper one i am more excited about my final days in casey for revision Okay, guys, so yeah, Marie Claire, thank you so much. Shout outs to her. Uh, if you want to become part of our revision program at KC, shoot us a message via lower seat, prepare for our summer holiday lectures. Uh, we're going to go, we'll be going down to Limbe, Tico, and of course, Boya is going to be the main hub. So, yeah, make sure to stick around. All right, let's go. 30. In an AC circuit containing a capacitor and resistor, the voltage across the capacitor leads the current by voltage across the capacitor. That's very important because voltage in the circuit would be different. Okay, let's look at it. So I'm going to give you a mnemonic here, Seville. Okay, so in a capacitor C, the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees and the voltage V leads the current I by 90 degrees in an inductor of inductance L. Okay, so that's how you take it. So the capacitor I leads V by pound two, which is 90 degrees. Voltage leads I by pound two for an inductor of inductance L. Now for a uh, resistor, I and V are in phase. Okay, we can come over here. Of course, clearly the answer is already C. All right, now why is the answer C? We have just said that in a capacitor, the current will lead the voltage by pound two. That means that the voltage would lead the current by negative pi on two. If the current leads the voltage by pi on two, then the voltage leads the current by negative pi on two. All right. So yeah, that's why our answer is C. Uh, but also we can talk about how do I then calculate the phase difference between the current and the voltage in this circuit, not only across the capacitor, but in this circuit. Well, voltage in the circuit, you would have to get that phase angle as Xc over R, all right? The reactance of the capacitor divided by the resistance of the resistor. Get tan inverse of that, that gives you that phase angle. In which of the following set does the expression Y define the quantity X? Okay, I've just really done some amazing work here. So we're just going to go over and then define our gravitational field intensity as negative of potential gradient, okay? Uh, so our potential at a particular point in gravitational field, of course, is negative GM over R. G is a universal gravitational constant. M is the mass of the generating field, for instance, the Earth. R is distance away from the center of the Earth. Uh, our dv dr, which is now the gradient of this potential, would be, of course, us differentiating this, this thing with respect to R. Gm would be a constant, so you send Gm outside together with this negative. If I differentiate 1 over R with respect to R, of course, I get negative 1 over R squared, all right? Hope your differentiation skills are good. Uh, so dv dr then becomes Gm over R squared. But notice that g is negative gm over r squared well most times when you're doing your calculations g is just gm over r squared but because the gravitational attractive because the universal gravitational force is an attractive force we often associate that with a negative all right by convention all attractive forces are negative and all repulsive forces are positive so because the gravitational force is a is a it's an attractive force that's why you associate the gravitational field intensity with a negative here. So you are going to have to get the negative of this. So negative of this potential gradient will give you this negative gm over r squared. Can you see that? So we can come over here. That tells you that, hey, hold up. That tells you that uh, gravitational field intensity at a particular point is negative potential gradient. Okay, this is what this tells you. Now let's come over here and do some math. Uh, Q is equals to CV. That's charge on the capacitor, right? So C will be what? Q over V, charge per unit PD. So B is wrong because it's charge flowing per unit time. That's not capacitance. Capacitance rather be charged per unit PD. We can go over and then talk about inductance because you can see inductance here. 
let's do that with respect to the emf that is induced across a coil so that emf is of course equal to the inductance of the coil multiplied by the time rate of change of current across that coil okay so we're going to find it we're going to make inductance a subject and if we make inductance a subject of course we have induced emf divided by di dt ratio of induced emf and time rate of change of current okay so c is off because it says time rate of change of emf only which is not true uh so eventually we get to z and we have f equals to mg of course that's what we have for gravity for when an object is in a gravitational field uh so g the gravitational field intensity of course the force per unit mass so you notice that our d is the right answer right there so we have 25 joules of heat energy is transferred to a sample of ideal gas at constant pressure as a result the internal energy of the gas is all right let's just go first law of thermodynamics mathematically dq equals du plus dw so let's make du the subject since we're talking about the internal energy of the gas here so du will be dq minus dw so what are we supplying we're supplying 25 joule of heat remember that this change is occurring at constant pressure if pressure is constant then it's possible for work to be done okay so you notice that our change in internal energy would be less than 25 because again you are taking 25 joules minus this amount of work that the gas does all right simply because this pressure is constant if the volume on the other side was rather constant then change in internal energy would have just been equal to 25 joules okay so you notice that the change in internal energy would be in, would increase by less than 25 joules okay so it would increase by less than 25 the only time that when it would be it would increase by 25 is if the volume was instead constant okay so our answer there is c a radioactive element of half-life five minutes half that number of atoms remaining after 15 minutes the initial number of atoms of the sample is okay so there are three major equations of radioactivity well the third one is just a bonus but there are two major equations in radioactivity that you solve like 95 percent of every radioactivity problem at the e levels using those two equations so the first one is c total time of decay is n t half and then we have n zero over n final to be equals to two to the power n the third one which is a bonus one is t half equals lin two over lambda yes some other questions will require you to know this now we're going to come over and they say from equation one you notice that of course our n here would be t total time of decay divided by t half our total time of decay is 15 minutes our t half is five minutes so we put those things in place we have our n to be three substituting two we are going to have our n zero to be two to the power n times n final but what is our n our n is three so you multiply those our n final n zero sorry is 3.2 times 10 to the power 22 atoms please take note that this equation holds true even for activity so you can use initial activity divided by final activity all right it's to give you two to the power n so our answer here is a a copper wire of length l and diameter d has resistance r what is the resistance of copper wire of length 2l and diameter 2d okay so notice that r is rho l over a right this is a general expression for resistance um so our area is pi d squared over 4 okay so we can simplify that to have r as rho 4l over pi d squared that's our equation one now you're expressing resistance in terms of what length and diameter because you notice that we're changing these those two parameters here now uh we can go over and talk about r new okay the new resistance when l is now 2l and d is now 2d so we're going to put in place of l now we're going to put 2l there in place of d down here we're going to put 2d or that squared will give you 4d squared now if we simplify that our r new is going to be that which means that r new is half r okay because 2 over 4 gives us half already okay then you have rho 4l over pi d squared remember that is rho 4l over pi d squared was our r so in place of this, you just put our R here, which gives us half R for our R in your so our answer is B. In figure six, AD is a uniform beam of length five meters resting on support at B and C. If the beam has a weight of 200 newtons, what would be the minimum downward force F applied at D, which would leave the beam clear from the support of, at B? So once we leave this beam clear of the support at B, the only way we leave this beam clear of the support is if this c actually becomes our new fulcrum all right so this is now our pivot so we're going to apply moments and then we're going to make sure that the moment on this side 
becomes bigger about this pivot okay so we're now going to let's just mathematically write that to lift beam clear of b would mean beam would have c as a fulcrum okay applying law of conservation of moments at c we're going to get f times one so f times one here the force times the perpendicular distance to this pivot now okay has to be equals to 200 which is now the weight of our beam multiplied by 1.5 notice that uh, you want to take moment about this point this this is only one meter here so we can take off that one meter from this other side so the weight of this guy is going to act somewhere here 1.5 meters away from this c are we together so you notice that this this is 1.5 so the weight is going to have a distance from this fulcrum of 1.5 that's why you see me multiplying by 1.5 here so our f is going to be 300 newtons all right so you just want this moment to be equal all right such that we can get this guy as a pivot okay so our answer is d there which of the following statements defines the emf of a device okay this is um section two of physics paper one all right so you pick e if one and two are correct b if two and three are correct c if one only and d if three only so we are going to go over and talk about emf a little bit work done per unit charge leaving the source in converting other forms of energy into electrical energy this is basically what your battery does right because your battery converts chemical energy into electrical energy in that circuit so work done per unit charge in doing that conversion is what you call as the emf of your battery now the power is iv okay power across a uh, circuit load would be current through that load multiplied by the voltage dropped by the load now but power supplied will be equals to current that is supplied to that current to that circuit multiplied by the emf of your battery okay so emf will now be power supply divided by the current dissipated so you notice that b is our answer so b says that what number one uh, b says two and three are correct so the ratio of the electrical power the device generates to the current it delivers that's emf and that's what we've just proven here three says the energy converted to electrical form to electrical from other forms per unit charge leaving the device very correct right so two and three in answer b an oscillatory system is said to be naturally damped if ooh, okay let's talk about this a little bit uh, so there are three major types of damping so you have on the damped systems all right so you see how the the oscillation is dying out with time all right uh, you have critically damped systems so from this maximum displacement it takes minimum time to get back to this equilibrium position and then over damp system from this maximum displacement you notice how it takes so much like forever to get back to the equilibrium position right now um it's very important for you to notice that most of our oscillations in real life are under damped okay or just naturally damped because we encounter just friction and then air resistance but critically damped devices are devices that are particularly designed to get the pointer very quickly back to its equilibrium position maybe the scale that measures weight your weight all right that pointer is critically damped because immediately you put maybe the weight of maybe buyer a wants to buy a fish and they place you place the, the the fish he gets on the beam balance all right so as soon as you get it off the pointer quickly goes back to zero and then you place the next guy so you can conveniently get readings as many times as you can within a very short interval that's because that pointer is critically damped gc 2021 they asked the students to give an example of a critically damped system so every pointer system that you know okay even in speedometers so the speedometer in cars those pointers there they are they are critically damped because you want that to get to zero as quickly as when the car stops okay all right so you'll get over damped these are systems that take forever to get back to the equilibrium position uh, for instance uh the the landing gears in an aircraft okay those landing gears are over damped and then uh yeah not not under that under damped systems would be every other system in real life so look at our tiny little dog here so you, you notice how it's oscillating right so we can talk about the various types of oscillations right here um so if you let this dog oscillate on this um oscillator over time the amplitude of this oscillation dies out right so he oscillates oscillates and then over time he, he, he can no longer oscillate right so he, the amplitude has died down to zero so he stays around the equilibrium position that tells you that that tells you that well there are dissipative forces in this medium so the system is naturally damped now the second kind of damping or the second kind of motion you can see here is if uh 
So every time when he swings to maintain the same amplitude and the same frequency of motion, you see him or the dog force the legs on the ground. So he pushes himself against the swing on the ground with the legs on the ground such that he swings and then when he comes back he pushes the legs again on the ground such that he never misses that or maybe there's someone who is over here and then always catches the dog and then swings the dog back the dog comes back you catch him swing him back and then he comes back you catch him you swing him back that kind of motion is said to be forced harmonic motion all right where you have an external agent driving the system to oscillate all right and the system basically oscillates at the driver's frequency all right so at that particular instant or in this particular motion when the driver's frequency becomes equal to the natural frequency of the system you that system is said to have attained resonance or it or basically just attains resonance all right so yeah all this doctrine here is such that you can see that one only is the only answer all right so naturally damped systems you simply need air resistance and just basic friction all right perfect um i could talk about yeah you know dynamos and uh how the back emf can you know act like some sort of dissipative forces but again i really don't have the time for this question all right let's go the stability of the nucleus depends on okay so we we'll just have some literature here it is defined what is binding energy i'm defining binary binding energy per nucleon it is defined as the energy required to be supplied to separate one nucleon from the nucleus okay so the more stable you are you want this amount of energy to be very high because the nucleus is very stable okay so if if the nucleus is very stable you need to do so much work to be able to you know break free a single nucleon from that nucleus all right so yeah so the higher the binding energy per nucleon the higher the stability of the nucleus it's as simple as that and that's what i've just brought out here so you notice that our answer is a the binding energy per nucleon has to be very high and then two says the neutron proton ratio uh following the stability line of course we know that neutron proton ratio is very important to determine whether or not an atom is stable all right and you know that when the neutron proton ratio is one it's a very very stable atom if it's greater than one it's not stable if it's less than one it's not stable but if it's greater than one of course you understand that um there's certain kind of decay that the atom has to undergo so in order to become stable again if it's less than one then again you understand that there's a certain kind of decay which in this case would be the atom emitting positrons because the positron is you converting a neutron to a proton oh no a proton to a neutron all right so if it's less than one you understand you realize that the denominator is super big so you want to get more protons converted to neutrons so the atom has to decay by releasing positrons again yeah um we're not talking about that so uh one and two right answers a power beam of monochromatic light is incident normally on a plane diffraction gradient. The number of spectral orders observable can be increased by. Okay, let's just write down the diffraction gradient equation. So our orders is d sin theta over lambda. But d is one over a, where a is a diffraction gradient specification. That's what you used usually here. This number of lines per millimeter. All right. So our m therefore becomes sin theta divided by a lambda. So what do I want to do? Number of spectral orders observable can be increased. So I want to increase m. If I want to increase M, I have to decrease lambda, okay? So using light of shorter wavelength, correct. Secondly, I have to decrease our diff diffraction gradient specification using a gradient with fewer lines per meter, correct? So one and two, correct. So our answer is A here.